uh, using glaciers and glacial sediments to investigate past climate change. And I'm just going to try and share my screen right now if I can. Um, hopefully that's showing properly for you all. So um, really, the research I'm going to present today is very much ongoing, but I think it's it's also very much laid the foundation for a lot of the work that I'm doing now and for the work that I have planned uh, for the future. And if time allows, at the end of this talk, I also hope to touch briefly on some of the new work I've undertaken here in Ireland uh, using similar methods to what I'm going to talk about um, in a moment. But just to introduce you kind of broadly to the, uh, what I'll be talking about today, this is a photo I took a few years ago of a very small glacier remaining uh, on the slopes of Mount Stanley uh, in the Ruwenzori Mountains, the highest peak in the range there. And although today glaciers in the Ruwenzori are rather small, uh, during the last ice age, the Ruwenzori hosted just an immense amount of ice um, with large alpine glaciers similar to uh, what you might expect or, or picture today in the Swiss Alps. And it's the sedimentary deposits uh, and landforms that were left behind by these ice masses, the evidence of their past fluctuations uh, left behind on the landscape that I use to reconstruct the timing and the magnitude of past climate change. And so before I begin, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge uh, some of the many people involved in this project, both in the US and in Uganda as well as the agencies that have funded this work and really make this research possible, including uh, the National Science Foundation, the Coma Foundation, and National Geographic. And of course, this project also involves a lot of field work in sometimes very remote areas. And our partners and collaborators in Uganda are absolutely essential to ensuring that we stay safe in the field and can find and acquire all the samples and data we need to see these projects through. So, just to get into it and think about really the motivation first for this work, um, we can start somewhat far from the tropics in Antarctica, but this is an ice core record from the Antarctic showing changes in temperature and atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations over time. And time is on the x-axis and extends from the near modern period to roughly 650,000 years ago. So at the top in black, is a record of deuterium ratios in the ice and the values of which correspond roughly with temperature. So warmer conditions are towards the top of your screen. And below this curve in blue is a record of atmospheric carbon dioxide as measured in bubbles of actually trapped ancient atmosphere held within the ice itself. So this is measured in parts per million. And you can immediately see the similarity between these two curves. When temperatures rise, CO2 rises and vice versa. And it's records like these that have really established the connection between carbon dioxide and temperature over time, and which help us understand today the influence of carbon dioxide on our climate system and the sensitivity of our climate system overall to greenhouse gases. But if we zoom in on this record, the picture I think becomes a little bit more interesting. And in particular, I want to zoom in on just the last 25,000 years here that I've highlighted in green. So here again, it's that same record of relative temperature change in the Antarctic as inferred uh, from deuterium. And we can see the cold period of the last ice age, which gave way to warming roughly 18,000 years ago, and followed by a period of you know, variable rates of warming over the next 10,000 years until we reach the Holocene, uh, which started about 11,000 years ago. And the Holocene extends all the way to today. And it marks a period of more or less stable climate, I think, around the globe, at least on this time scale. And if we plot the same carbon dioxide record below, we again see a general similarity between these two curves. And the timing and rate of change of these inflection points in these graphs may not match perfectly, but they appear much more similar than they do different. But if we next look at another ice core record, and this time from Greenland, the picture is a lot different. So this is a record of oxygen isotopes from the Engriff ice core in northern Greenland, again with warmer conditions plotted towards the top of your screen. And this record looks very, very different from the Antarctic record or even from measurements of atmospheric CO2. The onset of warming at the end of the last ice age apparently occurred much later and the transition between the ice age cold and Holocene warm conditions is much more turbulent and at times maybe out of phase or even actually really precisely antiphased with the record from Antarctica. 
And so understanding what the differences between these records really mean, uh, both in terms of local and global climates and what these differences can tell us about the function of Earth's climate system over time, and ultimately their sensitivity to carbon dioxide is really the foundation of much of my research. And, but to, I think, assess the mechanisms that can explain these records, we first and foremost need to know how these signals are expressed and propagated across the Earth's surface through time. And to do that, we need a wide array of past climate records from around the world. And while we certainly have a good number of these records from uh, all regions, we actually are missing something. We have very, very few records of past temperature from the tropics. We have lots of records that indicate changes in tropical precipitation, but records of past temperature in tropical regions are fairly rare. And it's this paucity of temperature records from the tropics that's really a fundamental barrier uh, to our understanding how the global climate system itself works. And the tropics are a huge region. They cover roughly half the Earth's surface. Um, and the tropics are also Earth's heat engine. They provide much of the latent heat and water vapor to our global atmosphere. They really um, form the foundation of Earth's atmospheric system. And through phenomena such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the tropics today are also the primary source of interannual climate variability to the Earth's system. And so understanding how the tropics have changed through time is hugely important for understanding our climate system and its function as a whole. And the tropics are also where people live. Uh, today, over 40% of the world's population live in the low latitudes, and this percentage is only expected to rise in the coming decades. And so really the fundamental question I think we want to ask is what role the tropics may play in both past and future climate change. And one of the best ways to do this, one of the best ways to assess changes in tropical temperature, I think, is to use glaciers. And glaciers are highly sensitive to changes in climate. Um, a friend of mine refers to them or terms them as physical expressions of climate on a landscape. And they shrink when it gets warmer, they grow when it gets colder. And so by mapping and dating the extent of glaciers at, at times past all around the world, we can establish the timing and magnitude of past climate change. And in the tropics, the vast majority of modern glaciers today are held in the South American Andes. But there are some few small glaciers left remaining in both Papua New Guinea, as well as at a few sites in East Africa. And the way we date past glacial fluctuations is using a method called beryllium-10 surface exposure dating. So this method has been used all over the world to date past glacial fluctuations. And this is a map actually showing the location of past or previous beryllium-10 studies of of alpine glacial deposits all over the world. And so while this method has been employed on every continent, there you can see are relatively few of these records from the tropical regions. And this becomes all the more apparent, I think, if we plot these same study locations much more explicitly by latitude and elevation. So this plot shows the same study locations as in the map above uh, with latitude on the x-axis from 60 degrees south to uh, north of the North Pole and elevation on the y-axis from zero to uh, roughly 6,000 meters. And as you can see, there are quite a few study sites in the northern mid-latitudes and as well in the south, but relatively few of these uh, sites are in the tropics and there are none uh, from the real uh, near equator region. And so with this project, our goal really was to establish a new site in the equatorial latitudes that could provide evidence of just how climate has changed in the tropics since the last ice age within a region where no such studies yet exist. Now, there are three sites in East Africa we could target uh, primarily for um, investigating past glacial and climate change. You may think first of a site like Kilimanjaro with um, a really iconic snow cap that's been um, glamorized over time. And you may think also of Mount Kenya, which is another popular trekking destination um, and hosts modern glaciers today and really gorgeous, beautiful, extensive paleoglacial deposits as well. But we chose to focus our work on the third site in East Africa that today hosts uh, modern glaciers. Um, and this is the Ruwenzori Mountains. We chose the Ruwenzori for two primary reasons. Uh, first, the mountains contain a huge array of very well-preserved glacial deposits for us to study. 
But the second main consideration is that unlike Kilimanjaro and unlike Mount Kenya, which are both volcanic edifices, volcanic landscapes, the Ruwenzori Mountains are composed primarily of very quartz rich bedrock. And it's this quartz bearing rock, like you see in this photo, that allows us to use the beryllium 10 technique at this site. Now, this technique technique allows us to date landforms that range in age from just a few decades old to many, many millions of years. And in the Ruwenzori thus far, we've really dated landforms that span the whole of the last 30,000 years. So really from the peak of the last ice age throughout deglaciation and uh, into the Holocene. Today, I'm going to focus on some of the landforms that we've dated that speak uh, more explicitly to the transition point between the cold conditions of the last ice age and the onset of warming and the subsequent deglaciation. So with what I present today, there are three primary questions that I want to address. First, when did warming begin at the end of the last ice age in the Ruwenzori? Um, this time period is also known as the last glacial maximum or LGM. Uh, second, whatever we find in the Ruins of Glacial Record, is this a really purely local signal or is this perhaps indicative of a more regional or pan-tropical pattern of climate change? And third, how do these changes align with changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide? Over the timescales of ice ages, it seems carbon dioxide concentrations are very well correlated with tropical temperatures, but how does this pattern hold over shorter timescales? And ultimately, with these three questions in mind, we just want to think about what can all of this information, what can these results tell us about past climate in the tropics? So next, I just want to briefly introduce the method that we use to date these glacial deposits. And I've said before, this is called beryllium-10 surface exposure dating. So if we imagine just a simple idealized glacial system like this one, uh, we can split our glacier into a zone of accumulation where the glacier is gaining mass through precipitation and a zone of ablation where the glacier is losing mass through sublimation or melting. The location or the elevation where the net rate of accumulation and ablation are equal is called the equilibrium line. And this is often roughly correlative with the freezing line elevation in our atmosphere. Now, as our glacier flows down slope, it will entrain boulders and cobbles and all sorts of sediments. Um, and it will carry these materials downslope and eventually deposit them along the glacial margin. So over time, more and more of these sediments build up in a ridge along the margin of the glacier. And if at some point climate changes, so let's say climate warms, our accumulation zone will shrink and our equilibrium line is going to rise. So as a result, the glacier is going to retreat upslope to find a new steady state geometry. And this means that our sediment ridge uh, that was along the glacial margin is abandoned. So this ridge of sediment is called a moraine and is the primary landform that we focus on in this work. So this is a picture of a moraine ridge in Greenland and this moraine was only recently abandoned by ice and you can see the very loose unconsolidated material that comprises the moraine ridge itself and the current glacier surface just a few meters below. But if we imagine if we could date this ridge, determine exactly when the glacier retreated from this site, we could determine just exactly when climate changed, when conditions here warmed. Now, after being abandoned by the glacier, the sediments on the moraine are, are exposed to the open horizon. So this means that they're now exposed to the incoming flux of cosmic rays from deep space. And these rays are sourced from supernova uh, and are constantly bombarding the Earth's surface. And they usually pass through matter without incident, including all of us right now. But every so often, these incoming rays will strike an atom here on the Earth's surface. And if we zoom in to the surfaces of these idealized rocks on this moraine crest, we can see the results of these collisions. So as the incoming rays enter the rock surface, every so often, one will strike an oxygen atom within a molecule of the mineral quartz. If this collision occurs with just enough energy, the incoming particle will kick out a few protons and a few neutrons, and what was once a single atom of oxygen-16 will become a single atom of beryllium-10. Now, over time, these atoms of beryllium-10 will build up, will accrue in the rock surface. And if we know the rate at which this process occurs, then sometime later, well after the glacier has retreated, 
we can collect a sample of the rock surface itself and using some chemistry, determine the concentration of beryllium-10 atoms in that rock surface. And from that, we can calculate the total duration of exposure of the rock to those incoming cosmic rays. So effectively, we can date exactly how long ago that rock was deposited by the glacier. So this obviously involves a lot of field work, which in places like the Ruwenzori can be a bit tricky. Because unlike in Greenland, uh, much of the Ruwenzori mountains are covered in very thick, lush rainforest vegetation. And so finding landforms and boulders to sample can be a challenge. Um, in this photo, I'm actually standing on a moraine ridge that I think we had just sampled a moment before. So uh, this is a picture more explicitly of one of the samples we collected during the field season in 2016. And David, our undergraduate field assistant uh, that year is holding up our scale bar. But that lump of vegetation in the center of the image is actually a glacial boulder set down on the crest of one of these moraine ridges. In this photo, you can also see some of the local guides and porters who make our work in the ruins already possible and help us navigate the mountains and, and help us keep us safe and, and find these samples uh, like the one you see here. So when we do find one of these samples, uh, we clean off the surface, record whatever data we need, and we use just a hammer and chisel to remove the top few centimeters of the rock surface and collect maybe a half kilo uh, in total of sample. So we take these back to the laboratory, pulverize that, that initial material down to the size of fine sand, and then we use a a series of techniques to first isolate the quartz from that bulk rock. And then from that quartz, we isolate the beryllium. And once we measure the concentration or the total amount of beryllium in that sample, we can calculate the age. So before moving on, I just want to be absolutely clear about how we interpret these exposure ages. If we imagine that we're sampling and dating the uppermost sediments on a moraine ridge, uh, these would have been the sediments deposited last by a glacier before it retreated. And so this means that we interpret the exposure age of a moraine as indicative of the time at which the moraine was abandoned by ice. And so the timing of past warming. Um, a moraine 17,000 years old would indicate that 17,000 years ago, climate conditions at the site warmed. So next, I'm going to take you to the Rowanzori, which is a small mountain range right on the border between Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And on this map, they're held within a small black bounding box. So I'll zoom into this box uh, next. And this is a relief map I've made of the Ruwenzori Mountains themselves. And the Ruwenzori are not a huge mountain range. They extend only 100 kilometers or so north-south and 50 kilometers east-west, but they have really an impressive amount of relief over the landscape. Mount Stanley is the highest peak. It's just over 5,100 meters in elevation. Um, and Mount Stanley, along with Mount Speak and Mount Baker, are the three still glacierized peaks in the Ruwenzori Mountains today. Mount Weissman's uh, the fourth highest peak, another high peak in the range that I've marked here with a green star. And this peak doesn't host any glaciers today, but was glacierized until the mid 20th century. So this next photo I'm going to show you is actually one that I took of those three high peaks uh, and I took standing while standing on the peak of Mount Weissman looking out. So these are the, the three high ruins or peaks today. And you can see some of those very thin, small remaining glaciers that linger on those high slopes still. But we, what I think you can also really see in this image is just how rugged the terrain is within the ruins or particularly at high elevation. Uh, you'll also notice how bare the rock is above 4,000 meters or so, there's really no vegetation to speak of, save for some lichen and moss cover like you see in the foreground in this image. Uh, and this moss does persist in slightly more sheltered portions of the high peaks. But as you begin to make your way down in elevation, things really change very, very quickly. Uh, this is a photo, in this photo you can see some of the really distinct Afro-Alpine vegetation that dominates in the ruins or between roughly 3,000 and 4,000 meters elevation. And as you continue down slope, I think you appreciate not only the lush vegetation to be found in the Ruwenzori, uh, but just the immense relief of the landscape that's been both carved by glaciers and really forced up by the uh, tectonic processes um, and the expansion of the East African Rift. So at lower elevations and in the valley floors, uh, these regions are generally infilled by wetlands and very, very deep peat bogs. And it's in this area that most of the wildlife thrives. 
but it's also at these lower elevations that you'll find some of the largest, uh, most extensive glacial deposits that correspond with the last ice age. So this is a moraine ridge that was deposited by a glacier during the last ice age uh, here in the Ruanzori. And the scale is a little difficult to judge in this photo, but the ridge itself has about 30 meters of relief above the valley floor. So really it's just a massive feature in this valley and it speaks to just how much ice was present in these mountains and in these valleys during the last ice age. Now, while modern ice is limited today to just the highest peaks, during the LGM ice flowed from these peaks uh, down slope and extended very, very far uh, down through the mountains themselves. And I'm gonna share some of our data from two of these valleys next, uh, the Mabuku and the Muliambuli Valley. And I'll start by zooming in to show you our results from the Mabuku Valley. So this is a glacial geomorphic map of the lower Mabuku Valley. The reds and greens and purples all correspond with surficial glacial deposits of differing ages. The lighter colors all represent glacial till and the darker colors show the position and extent of discrete moraine ridges themselves. So the red colors here show glacial deposits that were set down during that last ice age, during the last glacial maximum or LGM period. So to give you a better sense of the orientation of this valley, during the LGM, ice would have been flowing downslope from the west uh, towards the east and down valley. And so here, ice from two different catchments actually coalesced here to form a single glacier that continued downslope. So next, I'm going to show you some of our actual uh, surface exposure ages from this site. So here, each yellow dot marks the location of one single surface exposure sample, and the white boxes indicate the corresponding surface exposure age we have calculated. Uh, the yellow boxes here just show the arithmetic mean age of samples from a single moraine. So to walk you through this chronology, you can see that ice was at its most laterally extensive position around 29,000 years ago, and step back by a few dozen meters shortly thereafter at 28.7 thousand years ago. Uh, ice pulled back again 25,000 years ago and really made its last great stand of the LGM about 21 and a half thousand years ago. So this shows us that ice remained extensive throughout the last glacial period, throughout the last ice age, but apparently really began to retreat after 21 and a half thousand years ago. So the next question is what happened next? What happened after this time? So these are the same ages from the 21 and a half thousand year old moraine, but here I've just shifted the listed ages to the, screen, to the right side of your screen. We've dated additional samples from moraines in both valley catchments. And really these results indicate that by about 17.9 thousand years ago, ice had retreated at least five kilometers up valley from its maximum 21 and a half thousand year position. And so this is a real signal of glacial retreat following that last great stand 21 and a half thousand years ago. So this is the signal that we see here in the Mabuku Valley, but what do we see elsewhere? The next, um, I'm gonna just show you our results from the more Southern Muliambuli Valley. And this site represents a much smaller catchment area. Here we collected four samples from just one single moraine ridge, which indicate that ice had retreated from its LGM position starting roughly 18.8 thousand years ago. So a little bit later than what we see in the Mabuku Valley. But really, what did these results mean in terms of wider signals of climate change? Well, if we plot the arithmetic mean ages of those moraines from the Muliambuli and Mabuku valleys that mark the onset of deglaciation, so those innermost ridges that really mark the onset of warming and uh, ice recession, and we compare these re with records of atmospheric carbon dioxide, you'll notice something right away. So here the orange curve is again showing changes in atmospheric CO2 in parts per million. And while glaciers in the Ruanzori had begun to retreat by between 19 and 21,000 years ago, carbon dioxide didn't begin to rise until just before 18,000 years ago. So this means that the Ruanzori had begun to warm before the onset of post-glacial CO2 rise, which is, a, I think, a really, really neat result. Um, but the follow-up question then, I think, immediately becomes whether this is really a regional signal or if instead this is indicative of a wider, perhaps more pantropical pattern of climate change. And so to investigate this question, I collected similar records of past glaciation based on beryllium-10 surface exposure dating 
uh, from sites in the tropical Andes, all within this red band featured on the map, uh, the lower portion of your screen. So just to show you the, the, the methodology here, at the top of the screen, I've plotted the ruins ori data that I've already showed you. Um, individual surface exposure ages are in light blue. And immediately below these, I've plotted the arithmetic mean moraine ages in darker blue. And those moraines that really mark the onset of deglaciation, the time when ice began to pull back from its uh, last ice age maximum, are colored in red. Now, I've made a similar plot for pre existing records from the low latitude Andes as well. So here, those individual brilliant 10 sample ages are all in light green. And below these, I have plotted the arithmetic mean ages of moraines, so individual landforms. And each moraine uh, that marks the onset of deglaciation in a single uh, catchment, I've again marked in red. And the cool thing is, at the vast majority of these sites, the onset of deglaciation came before the post-glacial rise in carbon dioxide. So this tells us that what we recognize in the Ruwenzori is likely not just a local signal, but instead may be at least coarsely representative of a wider kind of pan-tropical warming. So this is really, really exciting to find. But then, of course, I think the next question becomes, well, just what was controlling this warming? If not carbon dioxide, what initiated the warming of the tropics before the rise of CO2? So here's that same plot of moraine ages again. And above this, I've added a plot with three separate curves drawn in. Now, each one of these curves relates to the amount of incoming solar radiation to Earth's surface. The characteristics of Earth's orbit change over time, and it's these changes that seem to drive ice age cycles over periods of hundreds of thousands of years. But the orange curve here that I've drawn in shows the amount of mean annual incoming solar radiation to the equator over the period between 32 and 16,000 years ago. And here you can see that orange curve equatorial insulation was actually decreasing throughout this period. So we really can't attribute glacial recession to local insulation change. If anything, we'd have expected this pattern to encourage the expansion of glaciers. The blue curve, uh, on the other hand, shows the amount of incoming insulation, incoming solar radiation at 65 degrees north latitude during the summer months. Now, uh, in 1940, uh, Milushin Milankovic first highlighted the importance of insulation at this latitude, in particular summer insulation at this latitude, um, as a primary control on the size and extent of Earth's ice sheets. And this variable is really today considered to be the pacemaker of Earth's ice ages. And we do see this blue curve in, uh, in this blue curve increasing insulation after roughly 24 or 24 and a half thousand years ago. But the thing is how this energy would be transferred to the tropics at this time period, we really don't know. There's no obvious mechanism that would transfer this energy of change to the low latitudes from uh, such a high, high latitude. The pink curve, on the other hand, is showing insulation at 65 degrees south. So looking now in the southern hemisphere. But this is not the absolute amount of incoming solar energy. Instead, this curve represents changes in the duration of the summer season. So as longer summer, a longer summer season means energy has more time and more opportunity to reach and warm the Earth's surface. And uh, some, some researchers have recently suggested that this variable, that the duration of summer in uh, the, the Southern Hemisphere is actually a major control on Antarctic climate and Antarctic temperature over time. So, we see that this duration of summer in the, the far southern latitudes was rising throughout this period we're interested in as well. But again, we have the same problem we do when thinking about the northern hemisphere. How can we transfer this energy to the tropics? So the mechanism that we've suggested uh, to help explain this pattern is one really based uh, back on that fundamental of, idea of the tropics as the heat engine of the Earth. 
uh, the export of energy from the tropics is really what drives atmospheric circulation. And it, the strength of this circulation at any given time is set by the temperature differential between the equator and the poles. Now, there's evidence that after 24,000 years ago, as insulation rose in the north and summers uh, became longer and more uh, longer in the south, the high latitudes in both hemispheres began to warm. Beryllium 10 uh, chronologies from ice sheets in the far north and the far south give indication of this. So this warming would have reduced the thermal gradient between the tropics and the poles. And as a result, the strength of atmospheric heat transport likely would have decreased as well. So less heat would have been exported from the tropics. Now, this is just one idea, but it's a testable one. It's a very testable hypothesis. And it's one I think that we also see shades of today. Right now, warming of the high latitudes is reducing the meridional thermal gradient, which some researchers are suggesting is actually the cause of altered energy and moisture transport patterns that we think we may be, be seeing, uh, uh, teasing out a bit of a signal from, from the modern noise. Uh, and so moving forward, as we produce more and more of these paleo records, uh, both in the tropics and elsewhere, this pattern, uh, I think, is one that I'm really, really curious to keep investigating. So really, that the main takeaways of what I presented so far uh, are that glaciers in the Ruwenzori and the South American tropics apparently fluctuated similarly at the end of the last ice age. And in particular, deglaciation of these tropical sites initiated prior to the onset of rapid carbon dioxide rise uh, roughly 18.2 thousand years ago. And we suggest that this may have been due uh, or may have been caused by a reduction in the thermal gradient between the equator and the poles uh, that was ultimately caused by increasing amounts of insulation to the both the, both the far north and far so southern um, latitudes. But definitely early days yet, and there's a lot uh, that can be done, I think, to test this hypothesis further and expand these, on these ideas in the future. But uh, with my remaining time, I'm gonna move away from the tropics and talk just briefly about a new project I've started up here uh, just over the last year, looking a bit more explicitly at past climate and glaciation in Ireland and across the North Atlantic. If we go back to these earlier plots of temperature and carbon dioxide, uh, the Greenland ice core record really does stand out, in particular for the rapid changes that we can see during the deglacial period between roughly 15 and 11,000 years ago. And these changes are thought to be brought on by changes in North Atlantic ocean circulation induced by the input of glacial meltwater. And they apparently can occur very, very rapidly. Uh, the transitions between warm and cold in the Greenland ice core record between near modern uh, and near glacial conditions may occur in a period in just a decade or even in just a few years. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow from 2004, this is that very scenario where ocean circulation change induces very, very rapid shifts in our climate. And Ireland is obviously immediately downwind of the North Atlantic. And so any changes to ocean conditions and the warm surface currents that provide our mild climate would obviously have profound implications. And climate scientists are very interested in these abrupt events, really for two reasons. The first is that modelers see dis distinct similarities between the rate of some of these past abrupt climate changes and the rate of modern warming that we observe today. And second is the fact that at the moment, Greenland is providing a not insignificant amount of meltwater to the North Atlantic. And there's a lot of debate right now about just how sensitive the ocean system may be to this freshwater input and whether and how such an abrupt climate shift, if it were to occur, might impact the world today in a world without immense ice sheets over North America and Europe. But climate models have a really, really hard time replicating these past abrupt events. And one of the primary reasons why is that there are just relatively few records of terrestrial climate change um, from the North Atlantic uh, uh, that uh, cover these transitions that speak to the, these transition periods and can provide a high resolution picture of how these events really manifest across the region. 
And that includes here in Ireland, but also places elsewhere in the North Atlantic, like Iceland. And so working with colleagues here in Ireland, as well as at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik, um, I started a project to map and date glacial deposits across both islands in order to establish really the precise pattern of terrestrial climate change we see during the most recent of these abrupt events roughly 12,000 years ago. And it's still very early days in this, but I'm really, really excited about this work. And I've actually just received funding from GSI to keep the momentum on this project going. Um, so if any of you have ideas or questions, please uh, just ask or send me an email and I'd be really, really excited to, to share more uh, about this work. And so with that, um, really, I'd just like to thank you all so much again for attending and coming today. And yeah, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much, Margaret. Um, as a really fascinating talk. And also I, I saw, I mentioned in the chat, but maybe you didn't see such beautiful images you have um, oh, of both thanks. Uganda and Connemara at the end there. So also a very visually stunning uh, presentation as well. So I think there's some questions coming in then. And uh, thanks for keeping to time also. So this from um, Porig, who uh, maybe I will read a couple that come in and uh, you can answer both of them at the time. So Porig asks, uh, th says, thanks for a great talk. Oh, there's more coming in and missing them. How would you test the hypothesis about the reduced heat transfer from the tropics if you wanted to prove that? Yeah, it's Porig's question. And then from Anna, uh, says, great presentation, Maggie. Are you connected with the developments of an all island network on biodiversity and climate change? She asks. So I'll, I'll let you take both of those and then we have more questions from uh, Miri and also one for myself. We'll take those next time. Sure. So uh, Porug had the first question. Yes. But, um, so for that, really to test this, I think we need two things. First, um, I think we really do need a wider array of past glacial records, past temperature records from the low latitudes. What I presented, I think, is um, a, a good amount of evidence, but very few of these sites that I'm comparing with the Rowenzori uh, display or provide a um, very detailed record of deglaciation within these catchments. A lot of studies aren't necessarily focused on this transition point. Um, that's really the focus of my work as far. So I've been doing a little bit of work in Peru to try and establish similar chronologies at sites there. And I'm still continuing this work um, in the ruins where to try and refine the signal that we see at this location as well. So, so by and large, I think essentially we really just need more records to really hammer this down and nail down the, the relative timing of change in the tropics versus the higher latitudes. But also then I think, um, introducing uh, and, and working, introducing climate models to this work and partnering with modelers who can really speak to the large scale dynamics um, as well. Our, our model, I think is based as a, a simplified view of the climate system, but it's ba it is based in physics, but definitely a more simplified uh, set up than I think maybe could be shown in reality. But first and foremost, I think we definitely just need more, more records. Um, and then Anna, you said had a question about an all island network. Oh, yeah, that's right. That. So there's um, um, Yvonne Buckley in zoology is kind of leading um, or heavily involved with this emergent kind of network as it's currently being talked about. I just it struck me from your presentation that this is something that probably you should be involved with in some way. I mean, it's early stages, but it's just to keep it on your radar. Um, obviously, from the School of Natural Sciences, the predominant participation is around climate change and biodiversity and their interactions. But um, there is clearly an effort to kind of consolidate climate science research or climate change related research more broadly within that. And, you know, it just would be great um, to make sure that you're able to participate with that in some way. So um, I don't know if you've heard, even heard about it. Yeah, no, thank you for mentioning that. I, I had talked, I, I had heard a little bit about it, but I haven't talked with Yvonne about it more explicitly yet, but I will definitely get in touch with her and see. Yeah, I think, you know, and again, this is maybe related to, you know, I'm not sure even if our colleagues in the school are even aware that you've arrived. I mean, obviously you did the, this presentation is a great way to, to communicate that. And 
you know, it's also great that, that it may be recorded because I think this kind of presentation will be fantastic for students as well to, to look at. We had talked about developments around frontiers in geographical research and, and you know, what you presented would be brilliant for that. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it, yeah, if, if you'd like, I'm very happy to kind of do an e-introduction. There's no need for me to introduce you necessarily to Yvonne, but, you know, just to kind of flag that if, if that would be useful. Yeah, no, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so I'll take uh, there's a couple more questions come in the chat from Miri and Iris. And I, yeah, I think Miri is, I mean, as a human geographer, when, when I listen to your talk, I'm always, physical geographers get the best terms. Last glacial maximum incoming cosmic rays. We never get to, to use such amazing phrases. So <laughs> Miri, following on from that, asks, because of the attenuation of cosmic rays with depth, of, depth through rock, can you speak a little to the precautions you took in the field to ensure boulders did not move down the local marine slopes, rock slide, um, being repeatedly buried and exhumed during periglacial rock cycling within the active layer, frequently a problem with small boulders, she notes, and has not been covered with large amounts of soil, snow or vegetation, the last being an issue in the, in the, in the tropics. Um, so that's Miri's and Iris, I'll take hers now as well. Also says, super talk, Maggie, can you say a little more about the about whether what evidence there is from higher latitude glaciers to confirm the role of these regions in linking to the changes in the tropics. So I'll let you answer both of those. Yeah, um, so Mary, that's a really, really great question. And we spent a lot of time taking a lot of care thinking about um, potential issues that may be caused by both the movement of these uh, boulders through time and their coverage by, by snow or soil. So first, thinking about just sample selection, uh, we really were very, very picky in the field, um, which can be hard, but it's so, so difficult to locate these boulders in the first place, but we re really were very cautious about selecting boulders that only occurred really expl explicitly on the crests of moraines, so nothing that was in any way, even just slightly off slope or off the, the true crest of the moraine itself. Um, and also we looked at uh, the geomorphology and the, the pattern of forest succession uh, with these landforms. Um, we chose boulders that generally had at least a half meter, if not a meter or more relief above that moraine crest to try and make sure that uh, there was no confounding influence of uh, potential snow cover in the past um, or recent exhumation. But the one key thing we did note too is that uh, generally as these landforms are abandoned by ice, they're very, very rapidly colonized uh, by vegetation and mosses that really stabilize these slopes as well. And so um, any put, we really didn't see any indication uh, with any of these sampled boulders that there could have been post-glacial movement or rotation um, at any period following that initial deposition and abandonment by ice. The second question though you had about um, shielding of these boulders from incoming cosmic rays by snow or vegetation. Snow, um, we really don't think would have been much of a problem. Certainly it's no problem today. Uh, there's no persistent snow cover whatsoever. And we think during the last glacial period, um, certainly in, in uh, locations similar to this in the modern, uh, with boulders that have as much relief above the moraine crests as those that we sampled here, snow really doesn't persist for any length of time due to the really intense incoming solar radiation at these latitudes and by any blowing winds that could remove snow uh, pretty rapidly as well that does accrue. Um, forest succession is a little bit trickier. We calculated the uh, impacts of, well, for each sample we collected, we uh, measured precisely the amount and density of moss cover on each of these boulders and calculated the uh, predicted impacts of that moss. And really in the worst case scenario, the thickest moss uh, amounts over these boulders uh, for the longest duration would only have altered the final ages by 2% at most which for very, very fine scale uh, climate considerations could be an issue, but for something just looking at the relative phasing of change as we are here, it's really not so much a consideration, um, but it is something to keep in mind. The one thing we don't necessarily have a great handle on is um, tree cover, which can also cause an issue. And generally our uncertainties there are more along the lines of uh, 
patterns of forest succession more than anything, because just the, the timing uh, of succession, the, the pattern of succession at the site really isn't well constrained by, by anyone. But again, just with our back of the envelope calculations, we don't see uh, any impact from attenuation by tree stalks or tree trunks um, over time by more than a few percentage points for the very, very oldest materials here, which at least for the results that I've shown here wouldn't, wouldn't change a pattern. I hope that answers your question. Um, Rory, I know you said that you had a question from Iris and I've already forgotten it. <laughs> no, no problem, um, I go back to it. So she said, can you say a little more about whether what evidence there is from higher latitude glaciers to confirm the role of those regions in linking to the changes in the, in the tropics, in the tropics, sorry. Yeah, no, I can. Um, so the map that I showed initially or earlier in the talk that had the location of all of the beryllium 10 records uh, from around the world, that map is only showing the locations of alpine glaciers. So the smaller glaciers you find in mountain systems like the Alps, but it wasn't talking about the signals that we see from the former large ice sheets, like the Laurentide ice sheet that was over North America or the Scandinavian ice sheet um, or the Irish ice sheet here. So uh, when you look at similar studies uh, to the one I presented here using the same methods uh, to assess the timing rate of change of those large ice sheets, uh, what you really see is that in time, uh, or even a little bit beforehand, but really in time with that rising insulation, we see as of 25 or 26,000 years ago, and certainly by 24,000 years ago, ice in the northern hemisphere was beginning to pull back. And in the far southern hemisphere along the um, margin of Antarctica, uh, there really isn't any terrestrial record that we can collect because ice was just too extensive. It was really covering all the land surface. But offshore, there are uh, sediment cores taken from the Antarctic margin that show an influx of meltwater, an influx of icebergs and the debris they carry getting flushed out from uh, the Antarctic ice sheet itself and entering uh, the sea, the um, southern ocean around the continent and um, really indicating that there's a lot of mass loss, a lot of ice loss from the continent kind of in time with this rising insulation. So that's really one of the major uh, pieces of evidence that we have that uh, even at the higher latitudes, even though things seem, seemingly remained fairly cold, uh, ice sheets were beginning to pull back ever so slightly and the conditions were starting to warm up and change uh, before carbon dioxide began to rise. I'm um, actually got a couple of uh kind of human geography oriented questions, but actually yeah. just M Mary, before we move to those, Mary kind of came back to, um, says lack of uh, snow precipitation equals glacial recession. How confident are you that recession was a signal of warming rather than aridity? That's a really good question. Um, so here in the Ruwenzori, we're actually working with um, a modeler, uh, a glacial modeler, Alice Doughty, who's at Bates College. And she's done a lot of work on uh, this project and on this problem. And really, from what we can tell within the paleo record, um, the ruins already today and in the past too are just always wet enough that the primary control on glacial recession is going to be temperature. So in places like the ruins already or in certain places, what, what we call the humid inner tropics, where there's always sufficient precipitation being supplied to the system, temperature is gonna be the primary control. It's once you get to slightly more arid regions, so within East Africa, uh, the Ethiopian plateau hosted a lot of glaciers during the last glacial maximum, um, or in the Andes, once you begin to reach uh, 15 to 20 degrees south, let's say in Peru and uh, extending southward into Chile, um, it could be plenty cold, but in those regions, conditions are much more arid, much more dry. And so it's glacial systems in these areas that are actually precipitation limited. So temperatures can change, but there's just not necessarily sufficient precipitation to uh, allow glaciers to grow um, as they would um, under other conditions. So that's, that's really the key we're looking at is both looking at modern conditions today and models of glaciers here in the Romanzori and along the spine of the Andes that give us a really great uh, kind of modern laboratory looking at different climate zones and, and how glaciers respond to change within each of those zones. But 
um, just thinking about the records we have of past precipitation from the tropics as well, and thinking about the timing of changes that we observe and that we can date using all of these methods and comparing them with uh, changes in precipitation. And actually from the tropical Andes, one of the major uh, pieces of evidence that we have that glaciers in those, those hu more humid regions in the tropical Andes were responding primarily to temperature uh, during the last deglaciation is the fact that all of these glaciers were retreating basically at the same time, even though uh, as we entered uh, that post-glacial uh, deglacial phase, uh, patterns of precipitation were very much antiphased on different sides of the equator. Uh, we see glaciers kind of responding in turn, no matter where they happen to be. And so that's really one of the, the major pieces of evidence we have for, for glaciers, at least in South America, doing that. And we see uh, the Ruanzori following the same pattern. But so a place like Ethiopia, there's emerging evidence that that would be a very different system, uh, much more sensitive to precip. Great. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah. Um, so I guess a couple of questions, one from myself and one from Maeve that are kind of mm -hmm. concerning, I guess, the kind of social practices and the kind of social conditions of, of the research. So Maeve asks, uh, she says, first of all, thanks for such a great talk. Um, as a, and she offers this as a human geographer token question that we're, we're you know, aiming to try and get rid of such, such boundaries. Um, she asks, could you say a bit more about the local guys that you work with in the field? Uh, what that relationship's like? Do you work with the same team each field study? And how key is the local knowledge for sussing out sites? So kind of the, and maybe I, I give you mine as well, just because and, and, mm -hmm. I kind of related to some extent. Um, I'm kind of curious about the kind of, let's say the kind of geopolitics of the scientific knowledge production in this area. And, you know, looking at, you know, the tropical regions of East Africa, also Uganda, of course, bordering with um, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, we can see from the maps you're showing and everything. So, you know, you were talking about how this is kind of a, a you're part of a emerging field of research, looking at, at uh, glaciology in this kind of region. So I kind of wonder, like, wh wh why is that kind of emerging? Is that to do with kind of changing networks of funding, changing security situations? So w what are changing in the conditions that make that research possible or of interest in, in more recent years that, you, that you're kind of part of this emerging field? Okay. Oh, definitely. Um, great. So, yeah, uh, I guess first to, to Maeve's question, um, we, the institutional knowledge, the, the knowledge that um, people who, who live in this area have of the Ruanzori is absolutely essential to our work. Uh, the Ruanzori are first and foremost, they're designated as a national park in Uganda. And so by law, uh, entering the park, we're required to take local guides with us. Um, that's just one of the requirements for anyone, uh, a tourist or, or a researcher entering the park space. Um, but those guides that come with us and the, the porters who come with us as well to, to help carry our samples and gear um, just are so familiar with the area. And one of the, the tricky parts of working in the Ruanzori is that the, the vegetation is so dense. There's, there's a really wonderful network of hiking trails and huts throughout the, the park that we can utilize, but going off trail at all can be really, really difficult, very time consuming work. And so being able to work with people who are so familiar with the park and so familiar with the landscape um, is really essential because that we can talk with them and immediately say, yeah, like have a conversation and they'll tell us there's absolutely no reason to go there. There's nothing there you want. We've seen the boulders that you like. These are not them. Don't worry about it. Or they can, they'll, they'll suggest different areas and, and different sites to sample that we would have thought were maybe uh, less likely to, to yield good results. But um, we've come along, come away with a lot of samples that we really would not have without their help. Um, so it really is great. And the ruins or themselves are a major, major point of pride for people in the region as well. They, the fact that the park is home to glaciers, um, they think is pretty remarkable. And actually multiple times when I've been there, we've encountered um, groups of kids on school field trips, like third graders or fourth graders who are taking a day hike through the Ruanzori. And you know, we'll be getting, getting up to our, our first uh, our camp one at 3000 meters and trying to catch our breath and rehydrate. And we'll just be some, a group of nine-year-olds blowing by us who are out for, 
a Wednesday afternoon hike, which is always a little bit humbling, but it's, it is great. So yeah, so um, really the people there are absolutely an essential part of what we do. Um, and they're all just absolutely wonderful to work with and really excited about the science too. Um, Thanks, and, Margaret. That's a really interesting answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, of course. Um, and yeah, Rory, I think you sort of alluded to a geopolitical situation. Um, I'm as part of this project, I've been working with um, James Russell, who's a paleolimnologist who studies lake sediments uh, at Brown University. And he's been working in East Africa for, I'm gonna say last 25, 30 years, but he's only really been able to start working in Uganda uh, explicitly uh, in the past 10 or 15. And it's really because of the, the political situation in the country and along the border with DRC. Um, so that's, that's one major fundamental element of change here. And secondarily, I think, um, not so much, there's not so much been a change in funding situation, but I think there's been a change in the recognition of what sorts of questions we can address and answer using these surface exposure dating techniques like uh, the one we use here. Because the, the method itself really only came online in earnest, I want to say, kind of uh, around the year 2000. And so it's still relatively new and it just keeps getting more and more refined and we're able to uh, date things more precisely, more accurately, and answer more and different questions or address more and different questions with this technique as well. And so one of the things that I'm working on um, uh, is a project in Peru looking to really refine the technique, not for beryllium-10, for, for quartz-bearing rocks, but for uh, another cosmogenic nuclide, helium-3, which is formed the, the very same way in the atmosphere, but um, is produced in volcanic rocks instead. So it's that that uh, we're using in Peru, looking at um, glacial deposits and volcanic deposits more expressly, um, and mm -hmm. hopefully in the future, looking at uh, deposits in uh, Iceland as well. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, Anna was mentioning the kind of frontiers of geographic research. Uh, I guess these kind of frontiers of methodologically, but also of kind of sites that become relevant then and the, the conditions. That, uh, that research got carried out. So we're, we're coming up to, and we are now exactly at two o'clock. I'm aware there's um, one more question coming in. So I will read that out for you. And uh, you also have um, a well wish from Michelle Curran from, from Galway. And you are a great presentation. Thanks, Maggie. Um, so if, if I, I'm aware, maybe some people have to, to, to leave uh, sharp at two, but uh, we'll go on with uh, the question and then we'll kind of wind up then if that's okay with you, Maggie. Yeah, um, of course. Iris also says, thanks, Maggie has to run really clear and engaging talk and answers the questions very well done. So the, the question is from uh, Ankit Verma from a uh, DCU, mm -hmm. DCU I believe, um, says, thank you, Margaret, for a great presentation. Incredible research you've done. I can imagine how difficult and painful the field work and lab work must have been. Uh, do you know how old the lithology was at the site in Uganda? And how is the solar radiation data is produced that you showed in one of your slides? So the age of the rocks in, Uganda is a very good question. That's actually an area of exceptionally active research. Um, I want to say that the age of the rocks themselves are between 50 and 100 million years old, but um, the age of the Rowanzori themselves are, are fairly young. The, the tectonic processes that have created the Rowanzori are thought to have occurred uh, mostly over just the last uh, 30 to 15 million years. Um, but it's still very much uh, an open question in geosciences, and I'm not nearly as well versed in all the tectonic questions as I should be for, for working in the range as much as I do, but um, the ruins are regarded, I think, by a lot of geologists as weird, um, so that's a very good question. Um, and second, the uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the uh, cosmic ray numbers that I produced or which ones you're referring to, but I'm happy to flip to a given slide if it'd be helpful. Um, Anka, do you want to clarify your, your question, the second question about solar radiation? I, th I think uh, he's still here. Maybe he, oh, there's a new message. Uh, I said, I am referring to the solar insulation data. Oh, okay. Oh, the insulation curves. So those, and go back here. These curves. Um, 
So these are all uh, from data that's publicly available. Um, if you search for uh, compendiums, uh, particular by Berger and Litra, the 1991 source, uh, usually you can find these, but uh, these are all produced just in MATLAB using a code um, that was publicly made publicly available by Peter Hybers. And if you, he's a researcher at Harvard University, but if you go to his personal website, he has a, a, an area where he just provides uh, for open use and open access all of these, a lot of different codes uh, regarding insulation and climate change and climate modeling. So just, just straightforward, simple stuff, but you can easily create curves like this one uh, using that, that MATLAB code.